Assalamualaikum. Welcome and good morning. Okay. Welcome to our live webinar series uh, at Breakfast at UM Health 2022, episode 27. I am Dr. Tajunisa Iqbal from the Department of Ophthalmology. We have a very interesting case uh, today, presentation today by Dr. Penny Lotpoiwa. Dr. Penny is our senior lecturer in ophthalmologist. She specializes in medical retina and uveitis. Uh, she trained in, at UM and uh, at uh, Singapore National Eye Center, as well as at Leeds, UK. And uh, today she'll be presenting to us a very interesting case regarding neuroretinitis and CAS. So for cat lovers out there, beware that they can also transmit diseases that can cause reduced vision and potential blindness. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Penny to present her interesting case. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Tanjun, for the kind introduction. So I will start my presentation now. Good morning, everyone. My topic of presentation today is Cute Cats Disaster Next. Malaysia is a cat-loving society and has a cat population of about 795,000 cats of 2018. And with the numbers steadily growing each year, it includes their strays and also pets. So many of us are pets lovers and then it's uncommon that we have cats at home, they have a close contact with humans. Cats are no doubt are very cute. However, they are also reservoir for the bacteria and some of the protozoa, so it can carry risk of sex. Sorry, like threatening disease. And today I'm going to look through with you some of the case scenarios here. So for the first case scenario, this is a 29-year-old lady presented to us with right eye central blurring of vision for six days. It was preceded with flu-like symptoms resolved after taking oral amoxicillin. There's no painful eye movement, no other neurological symptoms, urinary or bowel symptoms. Ufta phenomenons and hearing disturbance were absent as well. There's no history of tuberculosis contact. She has no high risk behaviors, not taking any traditional medication or oral contraceptive pills. This is all the causes to rule out optic swelling. And further history taking, she has pet at home and have a close contact with the cat. And for the ocular examination, the best corrected visual acuity is poor on the right eye 660 and good on left eye 69. That is associated with right eye break 1 RAPD. And the anterior segment examination was normal. It showed no anterior uritis features. And for the posterior segment examination, for the right eye, we can see there is an ill-defined optic disc margin. It's swollen with the freezing skin stage 4, hyperemic optic disc with disc hemorrhage. And there is also vessel torture CT and not to miss this early macular star formation. And then for the left eye, examination finding was unremarkable. And systemic examinations for this patient are normal. There's normal BP and blood sugar and there's no obvious limb adenopathy and skin lesion were noted. And we proceed with the right eye fundus fluorescent angiography for this patient. We can see early venous phase, mid venous phase, and late venous phase. And the positive finding here is late leakage was noted from the optic disc. This is also being called a hot disc. It's commonly present with the uretic cause of optic disc swelling. And then this FFA is also helpful to tell us like good information. There's no subclinical choroiditis and vasculitis for this patient. And this is the left eye fundus fluorescent angiography. And then we can see this is normal. There is no optic disc, leakage, or any other pinpoint uh, hyperfluorescent leakage from retina. We did not complain of visual field defect. The main symptoms is only blurring of vision. However, we know that all this optic disc swelling can have different type of visual field defect. So the Humphrey visual field for this patient can show there is inferior altitudinal visual field defect. 
Systemic Blood Investigation are very important to rule out the etiology of underlying cause of optically swelling associated with macular star. So some of the common infections are caused by syphilis, toxoplasma, leptospira, and all three serology were negative and TB was ruled out as well. And MRI brain and the orbit was done from the very beginning is still important to rule out any infiltrative or compressive cause of optic swelling. And then we do consider Bartonella Hensele serology in this patient because of the risk factor of the pets uh, with the cats at home. And usually this result will take some time to come back. So we will still need to treat patient clinically from the beginning after other available investigation result and uh, correlate with the clinical findings. And for this patient, the investigation result revealed that there are positive serology for the Bartonella. Both are rise in uh, IgM and IgG. So based on the clinical examination or the investigation result, so this patient was diagnosed with right eye neuroretinitis secondary to cat scratch disease. And then this patient was given oral toxicycline together with the systemic steroids. So two weeks after treatment, the best corrected visual acuity over the right eye improved to 6-9, show a very good response and with the reduction of this swelling. And now we look at the clinical findings, follow up and progress. Upon presentation, we can see there is the optic swelling and tortuous vessel and with the early macular star formation. And two weeks post treatment, there were a significant reduction of optic swelling and vessels became uh, less tortuous. However, the macular star are more marked and fully formed now. This is two months post-treatment and five months post-treatment. So we can see that the optic disc is not swollen anymore. However, it becomes slightly pale and there's also no more toxicity of the vessels. And we can see that the macular extrudation also resolves with time. So it's totally normal here without any macular star. So it can show that the macular star resolution, it will take about five months for a full recovery. This is the serial right eye visual field, the D-2 for the patient. So upon presentation, we can see that this type of inferior or titudinal visual field defect. Two weeks post-treatment, we can see the scotoma become less dense. And two months post-treatment, it becomes inferior acute scotoma. And five months post-treatment, it goes back to almost normal. For the second case scenario, this is a 24-year-old female college student presented to us with sudden onset of left eye, painless blurring of vision for one day. She had a history of high-grade fever intermittently for the past one month without any neurological deficits, headaches, vomiting, joint pains, cough, rashes, or enlarged glands. There was no painful eye movement and the fever had responded to antibiotics given by a medical practitioner. On clinical examination, patient has a good right eye visual acuity 66 and the left eye presented to us with 636 and there is sign of a left optic nerve dysfunction as evidenced by dyschromatopsia and however there is no RAPD at the moment despite there is some optic swelling that we can see that is hyperemic and slightly ill-defined optic disc margin at the superior side and then there is no evidence of any early macular star and the vessels also appear to be normal no sign of vasculitis or choroiditis at this moment. So the clinical diagnosis based on all the examination is left eye optic neuritis with papillitis because clinically you can see some optic swelling, and then most likely will be due to demyelinating cause in view of the young age and female. However, there's no painful uh, extraocular movement. However, it's too early to establish any diagnosis. As for the demyelinating cause of left eye optic neuritis, usually it would take a few days for the worsening of vision and then they will have a spontaneous recovery after a week or two and there's no other sign of uveitis as well to rule out other cause of optic swelling at this moment so this patient is under close observation
Within 10 days, her left eye vision deteriorated to 260 with grade 3 RAPD. Optic disc is more swollen now, and there is also macular star formation, which is a heart issue that arranged in a star shape configuration. And at the superior temporal arcade, we can see that the two corridors become more apparent now. And for the left eye fundus frozen angiography of this patient, you can see that there is a macular star noted corresponding to the clinical finding, and there is two hyperfrozen lesion that's corresponding to the with the choroiditis clinically, and there is a disc leakage as well with the optic disc swelling, and there is also vasculitic features. You can see the focal vasculitis from the FFA of this patient. This is the list of investigation were done for the patient. So first of all, CD brain orbit was done and the vision and life-threatening cause of optic disc swelling was ruled out. And then we can see that there's a high ESR and positive tuberculin skin test. Other common cause of neuroretinitis like syphilis and toxoplasmosis was ruled out. So at this moment, optic neuritis is very unlikely for this patient. So it's more to the infective cause. So uh, with the combination features of choroiditis and also vasculitis and also high ESR and these features, patient was diagnosed with the TB cause of uh, neuroretinitis. So at this moment, Bartonella was not done yet because patient deny any close contact with cats. And also, there's new onset of tender cervical limb adenopathy on the left side of her neck. So that patient was counseled for the limb node biopsy to justify the long course of ocular TB treatment. And also, patient is advised to take the TB interferon gamma release assay because it will further confirm the TB uh, diagnosis that is not due to the false positive of the Mantu test. And we do also encourage patients to go for Bartonella serology uh, at the late phase of the investigation because uh, one of the commonest cause of the neuroretinitis is still Bartonella. Patient refused to go for the limb node biopsy, however, agree for the following test. So, TB interferon gamma release assays was done, and TB quantiferon is negative. It's very important to do an interferon gamma release assays when element 2 test is positive because it's not uncommon that we have the uh, false positive of the MAN2 test. And this is very important to justify a long term course of the TB treatment that correlate with the clinical findings. So, TB is very unlikely in this case and then Bartonella serology was sent and the positive result came back with the high IgM and IgG titer. So the conclusion is don't jump the gun. So this shows a variable presentation of neuroretinitis and this is the case of Bartonella neuroretinitis mimicking tuberculous neuroretinitis. So this patient was treated with oral doxycycline 100 mg BD for 2 weeks and OD for 4 weeks with the total duration of 6 weeks. So after 2 weeks of oral doxycycline, she regained 6 6 vision bilaterally with the normal optic nerve function. And the corridor lesions along with the optic disrelling also resolved at 6 weeks. By now, I have presented two variable presentation of neuroretinitis. So what is neuroretinitis? It's a type of optic neuropathy characterized by the swelling of the optic disc along with the presence of heart extrudates at the peripapillary and macula. It could be due to infectious cause, immune-mediated process, or idiopathic. So among all the infectious etiology, Bartonella henselae, or also known as cat scratch disease, is the commonest, about 40% of all causes, followed by other infective causes like syphilis, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, and then sometimes it could be also caused by leptospirosis, Lyme disease, salmonella, histoplasmosis, mumps, and happy and HIV. So it's quite difficult to differentiate it from the different etiologies based on clinical findings because it's all non-specific. So it still depends on a lot of the investigation results.
I'm going to talk about cat scratch disease. The two neural retinitis cases are caused by Bartonella henselle. It's a type of gram-negative intracellular bacteria. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the prevalence of CSD in the United States is 22,000 cases per year. And cats are the main reservoir for Bartonella henselle. The cat flea is the vector of CSD. Is then transmitted to humans via scratches or bites from the cats. It can also be transmitted from a tick to a human. It can both occur in immunosuppressed and immunocompetent humans. Besides ocular bartonellosis, they could also have systemic uh, manifestation for the brain. They can have aseptic meningitis or encephalopathy or encephalitis. Then they can have aneurysm, also pleural effusion, pneumonia, endocarditis, some vasoproliferative lymphatic tumor, angiomatosis. They can also have vascular thrombosis, can have musculoskeletal disease, even include paravertebral abscess, and also they can have the uh, hepatitis and splenic abscess. And now, I will talk about ocular presentation. This is the commonest presentation that comes to eye clinic. It's about 5 to 10 percent in CSD. Neural retinitis is the commonest sign of Bartonella henselle disease. However, for the full blown disease, it usually takes about 7 to 10 days. So, in the beginning, they might complain of scotoma, or we can detect some papillitis sign, RIPD. Rarely, they can have retinal artery occlusion, retinochoroiditis, necrotizing retinitis, and sometimes perinocular glandular syndrome. And the optic nerve involvement caused by optic nerve or intraocular infection is due to immune response to bacterial infection or combination of infectious or para-infectious mechanism together. And the inflammation of the optic disc causes extrudation of fluid into peripapillary retina, leading to serious retina detachment and then with macular star formation. And the visual symptoms, it can happen within one to four weeks after the flu-like systemic illness. And the visual loss could be um, mild to severe and tends to be unilateral presentation. The most common visual field defect in neural retinitis is sicocentral scotoma. It may also present with central scotoma, arcuate defects, or otitudinal defects like in my first patient. So for the cat scratch disease diagnostic criteria, so this is more for the systemic bartonellosis. So they have to meet three out of the four criteria, like presence of a history of contact with cat, a positive skin test in response to cat scratch disease antigen, and characteristic histopathological finding from a limb node biopsy, and then negative lab investigation for other cause of limb atinopathy, and of course with all the serological tests. However, for the ocular bartonellosis, so we confirm the diagnosis based on our ocular finding, history of CAT, serological confirmation of bartonella henselle, and also negative uh, lab investigation for other causes. And also we need to do a periodic eye assessment. And for the system investigation for the blood, we need the serology test. So it needs to show elevated IgM or IgG for Bartonella henselle, so the suggestive of presence of past infection. And the sensitivity for the IgM peaks during the first six weeks of post-infection. And for the IgG title, it needs to exceed 1 over 256 to confirm CSD. And the titles between the 164 and 1256 suggest possible of CSD and the serology should be performed again 10 to 14 days later. So on the other hand, the emergence of PCR has excellent potential in identifying the Bartonella species in the ocular sample. However, it's quite expensive but it's sensitive. And the differential diagnosis has to be ruled out, include toxo, toxocariosis, toxoplasmosis, TB, syphilis, Lyme disease, dengue fever, sarcoidosis, and even Bechet disease. One should bear in mind that there is another entity of optic disc edema with a macular star that mimic neural retinitis, which is commonly caused by diabetic papillopathy and hypertensive retinopathy. So it's important to do a good history and also do a BP and DXT measurement in clinic itself. So for the treatment of the cat scratch disease, 
these are the choices of antibiotic. Since the disease is fairly benign in immunocompetent patients, it can be self-limiting among those immunocompetent patients. But for ocular disease, antibody treatment is preferred. The treatment aim is to promote the resolution of neuroretinitis, restoration of the vision and clearance of the bacterial load. Usually, we prescribe the patient oral toxicycline, 100 mg daily, and it has a better intraocular and central nervous system penetrations. So for the severe infection, we can add on oral rifampicin twice daily. And for immunocompetent patients, the duration of treatment is 2 to 4 weeks and it is 4 months in immunocompromised patients. And how about role of corticosteroid? It may aid in controlling the inflammation intraocularly and speed up the recovery of optic neuropathy. So the role of system steroid in treating the cat scratch disease with neuroretinitis is controversial due to lack of clinical control trials. So both the studies conducted in Japan and Malaysia had mentioned that a combination of antibiotics and systemic corticosteroid led to the good visual outcomes with no recurrence of neuroretinitis. So regarding the prognosis, in neuroretinitis, the optic distraining will resolve over 6 to 8 weeks, although some of the patients will have a mild post-infectious optic neuropathy as demonstrated in this case. So the prognosis of visual recovery for ocular bartonellosis or neuroretinitis is usually good. However, the ocular complications can be potentially sight-threatening. For example, sometimes they can end up with like central retina occlusion or necrotizing retinitis this can give you a permanent poor vision. Before I end my presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the other side threatening ocular infection that is uh, with the cat at the reservoir. For the interest of time, I only would like to give a brief description. So this is a case of ocular toxoplasmosis. So this is a patient, young lady, present to us with hand movement. So we can see there is a dense retinal choroiditis. At the macula, with adjacent scar, indicates a recurrent infection and mild optic swelling. So this patient, allergic to many types of antibiotics, so end up, we have to give the patient intravitreal clindamycin and after four injections, all the retinitis and choroidal is healed but end up with a scar. However, the vision is not too bad, able to preserve at 618. So ocular toxoplasmosis may result in significant morbidity and visual loss. It caused by protozoa organism, Toxoplasma gondii, an obligatory parasite of the cat. Human is one of the intermediate hosts, and then we acquire this from ingestion of undercooked meat or uncooked meat, drinking water or food contaminated with oocysts. So for all the cats lovers, primary preventive measures are very important to reduce and avoid the risk to get the site threatening ocular disease. So for the cat scratch disease, avoidance close contact with cats and cats fleas. You need to do a regular pest control, proper cleaning of the cats, and don't play too rough with the cats. Increase the awareness of risk of cat scratch. In case you get this, straight away wash it with the soap and also the running tap water. And then for the ocular toxoplasmosis, avoid raw meat products, vegetables, and proper heating of all meat. Washing vegetables and the fruits consumed raw, and practice a good hand hygiene for gardening after gardening, and precaution measures for cleaning the cat's litter. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Penny, for the interesting series of uh, cat-related infections. I think the main thing we all want to know is, uh, do you have a cat yourself? I don't have the cats myself, yes. But just my family have a lot of dogs, yes. Yeah. Okay, so is there any questions from the attendees? Uh, check under Q&A, there's no questions. Anyone has any questions? If not, I think for the benefit of the viewers, Penny, maybe you want to uh, tell them how to differentiate between neuroretinitis and simple papillitis. Well, sometimes mm -hmm. patients just present with optic swelling. So how do we differentiate whether this is infection related or just papillitis due to say MS or 
hypertension or diabetes and so on. Yeah. So I think that this is almost same with our second case scenario, the young patient. So the difficulty is always when this is a young female, sudden loss of vision, then we see optic nerve dysfunction. So then one of our main differential diagnoses will be like demyelinating cause because it's very common. But usually they will have painful eye movement. And with all the optic nerve dysfunction, we usually measure the visual acuity, the visual fail, RIPD, color vision decrease. But if present to us only few days is actually quite tough in the beginning because the duration of uh, the loss of vision is worsening over a few days and worse within two weeks but then slowly they get better but of course within the two weeks it's like very hard we do not do anything so it's very important we take the risk factor and get a proper history. So it's any history contact with cats and also any risk factor of the syphilis, HIV, fever, prodromal illness and all this. And also, because if optic neuritis, we do not need any treatment. In fact, they will get a spontaneous recovery. If you give a high dose of imidupra, it just hastens the recovery. Do not uh, alter the visual outcome. So what we need to do is like frequent follow-up, like the second case, ask patient to come back every few days because the macular star and other signs of uveitis, sometimes it only comes after five to seven days. So whenever we see macular star, then obviously we know that this is not a papillitis or optic neuritis, so that we do not go towards the uh, diagnosis. Then we need to start to think about all the infective causes, especially when they come with other signs like uh, vasculitis, choroiditis, uh, at the end, usually one or two weeks later. Yeah, yeah. A good history is important. To me, I look at two clues. Number one will be the presence of inflammation. So if mm -hmm. you have any inflammation, any cells, that usually points towards uh, neuroretinitis, infective cases. And then I think the other helpful clue is the lateral laterality. So unilateral mm -hmm. cases are usually neuroretinitis, bilateral, and you think of more systemic causes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other thing, uh, Penny, recently we had a case, yeah, recently we had a case of neuroretinitis uh, by a gentleman who had a dog bite, his mm -hmm. neighbor's dog with him, and then about one week later presented with neuroretinitis. So is it possible to get Bartonella infections from other animals as well? Yeah, so the commonest is still be the cats because we have a close contact with them. It's a good population in Malaysia. But not to forget that actually non-feline mammals, they also can transmit this disease like dogs. I think I have like reported few, but I think this is one of the first we see in our clinic dogs, right? Most of the time is cats. But other things can be like guinea pig or those who work in the jungle with occupational hazard if you're bitten by the hedgehog or more in other countries like raccoon, ferrets and not to forget any vectors. They can have the blood suction atropods like a tick and also bull ants. All these, they can transmit and harbor these at Bartonella hanselic. Yeah. So that answered the first question from Dr. Lau KP, who asked, is that dog-related eye diseases? Yes, it's possible to get neuroretinitis Bartonella from other mammals, like mentioned by Penny. Uh, there's another question, Penny. Uh, can cat lovers decontaminate their cats with any of these diseases? Do you know whether there's a vaccination or any treatment available for cats? I know for toxoplasma, they can... Uh, be devaccinated. I'm not sure for Bartonella. Can the vets uh, prevent this? Do you know? I'm not sure, but because uh, when the cats get infected, they can be asymptomatic bacteremia for quite a long time, for months. So it's still very important to make sure the cats do not have fleas. Actually, mm. because if they do not have this, they mainly actually caused by the fleas that infect the cats first. Then from the cat, when they scratch you with the wound and then they lick on your wound or they bite you, then you get the infection. Yeah. So I suppose if you send your cats for regular anti-flea treatment, mm -hmm. then it should be quite safe, right? Yes. And then there's a third question here the, by Prof. Tumkusara. She's asking, the second patient did not have contact with cat. So how did she get this? 
Yeah, sometimes it's a history. They say they don't have contact, but then you never know. Most of the time when we ask patients, do you have like rash or have any papules? No, but most of the time they do have fever, maybe one to three weeks ago. And for the second patient with a limb adenopathy and all this is actually part of the symptoms of the cat scratch disease. Of course, that we have to rule out TB as well. And sometimes if without cats, even viral infection itself can also cause a batonella, but uh, they're more good to the para-infectious phase later on, they get the immune-mediated types of neural retinitis. Yeah, but I guess sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to own a cat. Yes. I've had, I've had cases where, you know, patients gone to a neighbor's place or friends and they played with the kittens or cats and then they presented with neuroretinitis. So sometimes this type of history, they may not remember. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, Dr. Penny, thank you so much for the interesting cases. So if there are no other questions from the floor, I'll pass over to Prof. Dr. Shanga for the next case. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Thank you, Prof. Tajun.